Alrighty, so uh, without further ado, I will uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Ben Kemp, I'm the operations manager here at Grant Cottage. This is my sixth season. Um, I, I absolutely love the story, I fell in love with the story of Grant Cottage, but I've also been a Civil War reenactor since I was a teenager, and that has always fired my interest. Uh, my main interest has been in the, the uh, ordinary everyday life of, a, of, a, of the common Civil War soldier, more than the battles and the leaders that get a lot of attention. I want to know, you know the thoughts and feelings of the common soldier, and you can get that from diaries and letters and accounts that were written by veterans after the war. Uh, the subject we're going to talk about today, uh, his name is Hugh Clements, and um, he is not, uh, he did not leave a lot behind. I mean, he, there's, there's a bit of information about him, uh, but, you know, everything intrigued me about this case. This was something I had never encountered before. Uh, I had heard the term uh, galvanized Yankee, and you'll, you'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what that means a little bit more later, but I had never uh, encountered a, 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 a northern man that had gone south uh, before the Civil War, then uh, entered the Confederate Army and then later on uh, switched to the Union side. It's just, it's just a very bizarre situation um, and it could not have happened that often. Uh, we'll talk about some of the numbers of uh, galvanized Yankees and that kind of stuff. Um, again, always interested in the life of the common soldier and this was an incredible tale uh, that really begged for the research. And I, I, you know, I research too much, you can just ask my wife. But, the, but the, <laughs> two in the morning, are you coming to bed? But, it, but this intrigued me, and I've been researching it for a couple of years. Now, I'm with the Hadley-Luzerne Historical Society, um, and that's about 10 miles away is Lake Luzerne and, and the towns of Lake Luzerne and Hadley in the southern Adirondacks, and that's where this gentleman uh, was raised. So that's where the connection is. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, again, when I, when I jumped into it, Obviously, for me being a researcher, I was excited about everything I found out, but I have to warn you, uh, records weren't that good for the Confederate, you know, existing records didn't, didn't um, survive that well from the Confederate uh, service, um, and uh, there are some big mysteries still uh, that exist in his case that I wasn't able to solve. So I will continue to research this, uh, but I'm going to give you what I have uh, come up with so far. Um, and feel free to ask questions as we go along, uh, so you don't forget it. Um, and that was an actual image of Hugh Clemens in the Civil War. So we were, I was lucky enough to find one and ask the owner for permission to use it. Um, Hugh Clemens was born in July of 1842, actually in Vermont. So he was born in Vermont uh, to William and Eunice Clemens uh, in Wells, Vermont, which is, which is in Rutland County, just over the border. Uh, into Vermont from Washington County, so not terribly far from here. And, but at a very young age, about six or eight years old, uh, him and his uh, five sisters and his brother uh, moved into uh, an area just north of, of Lake Luzerne, uh, the actual lake in the town of, of what was called Luzerne at the time. And his father was a Methodist minister, and this, this map gives you an idea of how close we are to where he grew up, because we're at Mount McGregor down here at the bottom of the map, and just 10 miles away is, is where Hugh Clemens grew up. So we're very close uh, to where he grew up, and that'll come into our story a little bit later. Uh, his proximity to Mount McGregor makes a difference uh, in the end. <clears throat> so, over the river and through the woods, uh, you'll find Hugh Clemens' house. So, he grows, grows up in this community, he has a pretty normal childhood, it, you know, goes to the local school, uh, he spends about 10 years growing up in, in Luzerne, and uh, there's not much about his early life, nothing, no interesting stories or tales, just a normal neighborhood kid. Um, things start to get interesting uh, as Q uh, gets into his later teen years, and at a fairly young age, Hugh decides, his parents are still alive, Hugh's parents live, live quite a long time, but at a fairly young age, for reasons unknown, I was not able to figure this out, one of the biggest mysteries that still bothers me about the case, but it, it intrigues me, is Hugh moved to southern Georgia with his sister, his older sister, and his brother-in-law, his older sister Martha and brother-in-law Elijah. This is the part that really confuses me. 
Um, I'm sure there's a reason. Obviously, you don't just move 1,000 miles from home, literally 1,000 miles to southern Georgia without some reason. Um, but I wasn't able to get that in any of the census records or any of the records I could find. I reached out to the small communities in southern Georgia and wasn't able to find anything out down there. So that will remain a mystery, but at a young age, as a teenager, he went with his uh, sister and brother-in-law uh, to uh, southern Georgia, and we're looking at uh, deep southern Georgia. You're looking at um, 60 miles from the coast itself, uh, from the Gulf of Mexico, and you're looking at uh, about 13 miles from the Florida border. Um, so it's, it's way down south in a place called Valdosta, uh, which is in Lowndes County. I think it was in Brooks County at the time. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a growing community. It was, they were just getting the first uh, railroad through, and Valdosta it became the county seat. Uh, so right around the time they're moving in, it is a growing community. So maybe that has something to do with the opportunities. Uh, still, it's a very long distance to go uh, when all the individuals involved were born in the Northeast. So I don't know what the connection is to Georgia, but this is interesting. Uh, what else? Uh, so we're going to go into what they did once they moved south. So this is about 1858 uh, that they moved down there. We don't have an exact date, but just before the Civil War. Um, and what are they going to do for a living down there? What is, what is uh, Hugh and Elijah going to do for a living down there? Well, it, uh, I mean, there was quite a large slave population at the time of, uh, of enslaved people, and, and it was actually 51% of the population of Brooks County uh, was, was, uh, was, was slaves at the time, uh, which, is, which is a, it was a considerable cotton-producing uh, area. Um, so certainly they would have, uh, I would imagine, have a little bit of culture shock down there because that's not something they would be used to in the southern Adirondacks. Uh, these large, sprawling uh, plantations on the plains, on the coastal, you know, coastal plains uh, of southern Georgia, uh, you know, would have been a whole different uh, uh, culture down there. So that would have been interesting to, to, to see how they uh, adjusted to all that. Um, Hugh starts working in a factory where they built pails and barrels. And so he's a cooper, what they call a cooper, and his brother is a, is a, is a candy man. Uh, you know, I guess is what it's confectioner, so he, he either makes candy or a combination of candy and pastries. That's what confectioner means. And, um, and that's how they made a living before the Civil War. Um, and it looks by the records that maybe his, his brother-in-law actually uh, really kind of established a little bit of a, of a, of a business down there and they uh, maybe bought some property. So he may have really established him down there, whereas Hugh was still pretty young. I mean, he, he didn't have his own home. He was boarding with someone else. Um, so, but he was keeping busy. He was, he was making money. Um, and again, a lot of mystery surrounding this move and why they stayed there. So, in January of 1861, um, we have the Ordinance of Secession. So re the Republic of Georgia, uh, or Georgia, uh, secedes from the Union in January of 1861. So at this time, maybe two to three years they've been there in Georgia. They're slightly established. Perhaps, I don't know, this is just speculation, but perhaps they didn't move back immediately due to the fact that a lot of, there was some speculation that this wouldn't last, that this was just a political maneuver, that it wouldn't end in a conflict. So maybe they were just holding out because Elijah, maybe he had a good business down there. He didn't want to give that up. Uh, so, so that's my, my uh, guess as to why they may have stayed. Uh, again, a lot of people thought if a war did happen, it would be very quick. Uh, and uh, there wouldn't be any reason to fight in it if you didn't want to. Um, but the Confederate military records, as I said, are really not that reliable. So we have to, as early as... Um, July of 1861, so a couple months after Fort Sumter is fired on, the 13th Georgia, the Piscola Volunteers, uh, form uh, in Brooks County, the same county that they're living in, Elijah and Hugh. And there's no records that they joined or were coerced into the Confederate service at that time. Uh, there was no conscription in 1861. You didn't have to serve in the military in 1861, uh, but it's possible they did, and there's some evidence that they may have been in, in the service that early. Uh, and again, there's evidence that we'll go through that proves that um, there is a substantial possibility that they were both uh, in some way coerced or, or forced, or what they 
uh, also term is press into service. So the records, uh, at first, they would have been, uh, the 13th Georgia would have been sent to the islands off the coast of Georgia, uh, an island called St. Simon's Island, um, and that's where they would have been for a while. The first we actually see of both of these men in the Confederate service is in uh, February of 1862, they actually officially enroll um, Hugh in the 13th Georgia, which soon afterward becomes the 26th Georgia, the Company C of the 26th Georgia. But he's enrolled in Brunswick, Georgia, which is 130 miles away from Valdosta, towards the coast. So you start to say, well, why are they, and it's very close to St. Simon Island. So you say, well, those early records are probably lost. He probably was serving in 1861, um, but this second record is, reflects him uh, signing up for, uh, because some of those early enlistments for Confederate service, just like Union service, were for very short periods of time, uh, sometimes under 12 months. Uh, so this could be a re-enlistment, and it was a re-enlistment, uh, for at least another year. And within a month, uh, he was re-enlisted after the Conscription Act, which came in April. He was re-enlisted for three years, which was the Conscri Conscription Act in April of 1862 required all residents uh, between 18 and 35 to serve in the, in the military, with some exceptions for, as we know, slave owners, uh, which was not uh, popular. Uh, but the Conscription Act was, if you voluntarily uh, volunteered for the Conscription Act, you did not have to, you, you, you were given an actual bonus uh, of $50. And there's no record that uh, that was given to Hugh Clements or his brother-in-law uh, brother Elijah. So there's, there's some evidence there that, you know, this was not voluntary. So... Pretty early in their service, uh, you know, they're forming up in May. I mean, they're, they're, they're enrolling in May. By June, the end of June, they're already up on the peninsula. And, and if anybody knows a little bit about Civil War history, in early 1862, in the spring of 1862, McClellan, uh, the General McClellan of the, of the Union Army, he brought his, his forces down to a peninsula uh, below Richmond, and he tried to push his forces up and take the Confederate capital of Richmond in Virginia. And there was a series of battles as the Confederates pushed the, the McClellan back down the peninsula, and uh, one of them was Gaines Mills, and, and that was the first conflict that the 26th Georgia saw action. And um, so that would be what the uh, soldiers of the time would have called seeing the elephant. So that was, that was seeing the elephant. That was seeing a battle for the first time. Um, the casualty rates in that battle wouldn't be too severe uh, for the first engagement, uh, but it must have been a shock to those troops. Uh, they were commanded by Stonewall Jackson, uh, who's the uh, character there in the corner. So we have Stonewall Jackson. Of course, he did not survive the war, uh, but while he was alive, he, did, he was the commander of, of uh, the overall commander that the 26th Georgia was under. So, you, you know, you, you kind of try to get this, you know, you imagine this man who's in these men, uh, but, but specifically Hugh Clemens, he's a young man, he's been pressed into Confederate service, and that's fine when you're just camping and you're moving from one place to the next, you're on a boat, you're on a train. It starts to get serious when those bullets start to go by your head. I mean, that's got to be a whole different mental game for someone who's, you know, maybe it, as early as this time he's trying to think of, ways to get out of this, uh, ways to escape this, but he's behind enemy lines. Uh, there was severe punishments for desertion, and uh, so he was, he was stuck there to some extent. Um, you know, so there, there is a reason why he would have stuck around. So the second battle of Bull Run, there was a first battle uh, in, of Bull Run in, in early 1861, the first major battle of the Civil War, but they, there was a second battle the following year in the summer, the midsummer of the following year, 1862, and the 26th Georgia was one of the first units engaged, and they were engaged with what uh, became famous as uh, the uh, Iron Brigade. So the Iron Brigade uh, is, is battling against the 26th Georgia, and you can see just on the other side you have fellow New Yorkers 
uh, that the 26th Georgia is going to be in conflict with, and this will happen, um, you know, uh, throughout his engagement. We'll mention that. But the Iron Brigade was, uh, this was their first major engagement. They were West, Western soldiers, and it was, it was an amazing fighting uh, for, for fairly new troops. Uh, these troops, they just battled each other less than 100 yards apart. It was furious. And they, they went at it for hours and into the darkness. It, it began in the late evening and it went into the darkness, this initial engagement of the second battle of Bull Run called Brawner's Farm. Um, and it was just a terrible engagement. In fact, uh, they just stood there and, and, and um, took casualties. Uh, I'll read an account, because always first-hand accounts always uh, bring it out better. Um, McClellan had seen the, uh, the Iron Brigade, and that's where they got their nickname, is, is McClellan um, had commented to the brigade commander saying that the, uh, the, this brigade must be made of iron. So that's where they got their name, nickname, the Iron Brigade. So one of the members of the 26th Georgia writes home to a newspaper, and he says he wants to uh, write a few lines of commemorative of the gallantry of the 26th Georgia Regiment upon the bloody and well-contested field of Manassas on Thursday. That's what they called Bull Run in the South, Manassas, on Thursday, the 28th of August, 1862. Just before dark on the evening of the 28th, the 26th was drawn up in line of battle in a skirt of woods near the battlefield. We marched steadily across an open field for four or five hundred yards, through which the balls were flying by thousands, without firing a single shot. Men were constantly falling from the ranks, but our brave Georgians wavered not. As a man fell, his place was immediately filled by another, and the regiment moved steadily to the front. As we neared the enemy, General Jackson rode up behind the brigade and urged us by the memory of our noble state to one bold stroke, and the day would be ours. And gallantly did the brave men to whom he was speaking obey his orders. Volley after volley was poured into the ranks of the enemy with terrible effect. They still held their ground, and our ranks kept getting thinner and thinner. After firing several rounds, General Lawton gave orders for the brigade to fix bayonets and charge the enemy. At the command, every man bounded over a fence and separated them from the enemy, and with a true Georgia yell, rushed upon them. Then it was that the 26th suffered so terribly. Men fell from the ranks by dozens. Still, they wavered not. It was a heart-sickening sight to me as I gazed upon the regiment when formed after the battle. The 26th Georgia had lost 12 commissioned officers, 125 non-commissioned officers and privates. That was a staggering 74% casualty rate. So it's pretty much a miracle that Hugh made it out of that fight uh, without a scratch. But that was just the beginning, really, those two battles there, because they would go on to the Battle of Antietam. This is General Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia. This is their first foray onto northern soil, and they're going up into Maryland, and uh, they meet the enemy at a place called uh, Antietam Creek, which is now known as the Battle of Antietam. And there's a they, they were engaged in one of the most terrible locations in the battle, one of the fiercest areas of fighting, which was the cornfield. It was corn that was grown, um, you know, fully grown by this time, and, and they, you know, they're, as you can see in the imagery, that this is this is a terrible place to fight. You can't even see your enemy half the time, um, and there's just bullets just tearing tearing through the cornfield. Um, so there was massive casualties, uh, and of course this would go down in history as the bloodiest day in American military history, the, the Battle of Antietam. Uh, so it's not a place you would want to be. Uh, especially not a place you'd want to be forced into um, wearing Confederate outfit and fighting for a side you didn't want to fight for. A short description of what they did on that morning. At about 5.30 in the morning of the 17th, that was the day of the battle, by Seymour's brigade of Meade's division, um, the brigade was attacked. Uh, and, and at 6 a.m., it was attacked by three brigades of Doubleday's division on the left. After losing its commander, this is the commander of the brigade, um, that the 26th Georgia was in, and more than one half its members. So you're looking at 50% casualties in the brigade. They, uh, the fighting is so severe in the in the in the cornfield that they actually have to pull back after just that few hours of fighting in the morning, and, and they're replaced by other other units. So it, it, it shredded the, the brigade, and then they are replaced by someone else. Um, 
so the, the battles are one thing, the battles he has to deal with, and then uh, there's the other side of being a, conf a confederate as well, which this is a hotly debated subject, is how ragged were, were the confederates? How, how poorly supplied were they? If you go to you know, Civil War message boards, they have you know, 100 page debates on this, whether or not uh, it's true that they had trouble getting supplies, uh, how poorly supplied or, or clothed or fed were they. Um, there's a lot of accounts that support that there were definitely times during campaigning when the Confederates uh, did lack supplies. That even happened to the Union, too. And sometimes they even lacked shoes. And I'll read an account uh, by a member of the 26th Georgia talking about their, um, their lack of provisions. He said, we are frequently surprised by receiving letters from home congratulating us on being so well prepared for a winter campaign. This is in uh, December of 1862. He says this is probably true with regard to most of the Georgia troops in Virginia, but in reference to Lawton's brigade, it is very far from the truth. Lawton's brigade is composed of the 13th, 26th, 31st, 38th, and 60th, and 61st Georgia regiments, and I venture to assert that a more gallant set of men were never em embodied under one command. At the last report from our brigade, we had 705 men without shoes. Uh, and there are numbers without a single blanket to shelter them from the cold. This is no fiction, but a simple statement of the truth. Georgians, think of this. Think of such a number of these men who have added in making the name of Georgia illustrious, marching 20 and 25 miles per day with nothing to shelter their feet from contact with the snow, frost, and rocks, and without a blanket to shelter them from the chilling blast at night, and this too without a murmur at their hard fate. Yeah, there probably was a few murmurs, honestly. I mean, you read journals, you read, you read. Yeah, there was probably a few murmurs. And you know what? This may have been, and, and it's known to be in some situations, a little bit exaggerated by the commanders. They were trying to push uh, for more supplies. So they're going to you know, do this by writing home. Uh, so they're, you, know, you take it with a grain of salt. But still, there was definitely times when they would have provision problems with both food and clothing, especially while on campaign. Uh, obviously, if the, if the supply train could not keep up with them, um, then they had to go without for a while. Um, so again, that's another thing that would have made this service difficult other than dodging bullets. Um, his luck at, to this point was, was pretty good. You know, Hugh Clemens had, he had avoided uh, some of the worst. Uh, we don't have any record that he was wounded uh, before December of 1862, but on December 13th of 1862, we have just a brief record. We don't know what happened, but we have a brief record that Hugh received an unknown wound at the Battle of Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, on December 13th. Um, we know only that he was given a 20-day uh, furlough, and I'm sure this wasn't to go home. Uh, this was just uh, uh, you know, a furlough from duty uh, so that he could recover. Uh, so again, we don't know the nature of it. It wasn't talked about later in his life or in pension records. So it, it, it was probably not terribly severe, uh, but he was obviously able to recover from this. Um, so after Fredericksburg, you have, uh, which of course was a, it was a Confederate victory, the Confederates on, on a roll. And then the, you know, Robert E. Lee uh, is, 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 is beating the Union forces at every engagement. And he's ready to, they're getting, he's getting older, he's getting ready to make a move to the north again, um, as he had the previous year at Antietam. So the Battle of Chancellorsville happens in May, and the 26th Georgia is there, um, and, and probably the last engagement that Hugh Clemens was with the 26th Georgia would have been the ba second Battle of Winchester as the uh, uh, former uh, command went into the Shenandoah Valley and was at the Second Battle of Winchester in June. And again, you can see the dates, June 13th through 15th. So this is only a few weeks before Gettysburg. Gettysburg. There you go. So yeah, so we've got our, our, the, the Confederate forces moving north uh, into, you know, fairly deep, as deep as they're going to get pretty much, into uh, Union soil. Um, so into the north. So does anybody have any idea what's going to happen? <laughs> Um, so they call that the high tide of the Confederacy, and, um, and, and of course it culminates at Gettysburg on July 3rd. Now, during the Gettysburg campaign, uh, Hugh takes his opportunity finally. He sees an opening. Uh, 
the best opening he's probably going to get. Maybe he even senses, as many did, this large battle looming on the horizon. And uh, he ends up being deserting the Confederate forces. And he gets picked up in Hanover, Pennsylvania, which is only 13 miles away from the Gettysburg battlefield. And he gets picked up on July 3rd. Uh, so he avoided the Battle of Gettysburg narrowly, and uh, there's no question that he probably uh, was, even though he was a POW, he was probably relieved, because 13 miles away, there's almost no chance that he did not hear the massive cannonade going off uh, just before Pickett's charge on July 3rd. Uh, so, you know, certainly he, he probably thought at that point that he had probably made the better decision uh, of two difficult decisions. Uh, he was sent to Baltimore with the rest of the Confederate POWs. I mean, you, you think about this man, he's, he's got a northern accent. I mean, there's very little chance that he got a full southern accent just in those few years that he spent in Georgia. Um, so you can imagine his captors immediately saying, I'm, I was born in Vermont. You know, I'm, like, I'm a Yankee. Uh, but he's wearing Confederate outfit. How can you, you know, so they have to put him in prison. That's, you know, he, he's a Confederate, he's in the Confederate service. Uh, officially, so they have to put him in prison with the rest of them. He made his 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 it, it known very early on that he would serve the Union forces, um, and we'll talk about why Confederates even considered this idea of joining uh, the Union forces, because if there was any other option, obviously they would have taken it. Um, so we have Fort McHenry. He was sent to shortly. That's in uh, near Baltimore. And Maryland, and then he was sent to kind of this fortress. It's got a moat around it. It's on an island, and it's got a moat. Uh, and uh, that's Fort Delaware. Um, and so he's held there for the whole summer of 1863 until they figure out their 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 the government, as we'll mention in a moment, is trying to figure out what to do with all these uh, prisoners. Swallowing the dog, so galvanizing. Uh, as, you, as, as, as what we've been talking about. Galvanizing is when a Confederate, a former, uh, a Confederate prisoner of war or a Union prisoner of war takes an oath to fight for the other side. Uh, it, you know, and again, we'll talk about the motivations for that, why they would do that. The main motivation was prisoner exchanges. You give us your prisoners, we give you our prisoners a matching amount, and we switch. We hold them for parole. When we got enough, we'll switch. This is what was happening in 1861 and 62. There was a prisoner exchange cartel. It fell apart. One of the main reasons is because uh, the Confederates, uh, the Confederate uh, states, um, adopted a policy that was uh, not acceptable to the Union in regards to African American soldiers. That was not acceptable. That they were going to be treated differently. And they were going to um, punish the uh, even the uh, uh, white commanders uh, severely. Uh, so again, they weren't abiding by the rules of the cartel, and the unit, and the cartel fell apart in early 1863. So there was it, the the exchanges stopped. So the only way back before then, you could obviously wait to be paroled. You wouldn't have you wouldn't join uh, the other military uh, to get out of. Obviously, the main motivating factor is to get out of four walls, to get out of the horrible prison camp conditions. Uh, but you would have waited if you had a chance to be exchanged. Now that chance is gone. So what are you going to do? Okay, I'll take the oath. I'll say the words. I'll sign the paper. Um, so about 5,600, uh, or 5,600, I should say, Confederates galvanized. That's an estimate. Um, both sides were very wary of these galvanized men, and you can understand why. I mean, these <laughs> first opportunity they get is, is really in their heart to fight for the other side, really. Um, and so they were wary, and it was for a good reason. I mean, for instance, um, they had 250 galvanized Confederates. So these are Union men from in the South that had galvanized as Confederates. Uh, 250 of them became engaged with a Union um, regiment, and, and they tossed their arms down and surrendered. So you can get that idea of why they, you know, from this they learn, okay, maybe we shouldn't put them into action against each other. We have other things we can do in the military, and uh, General Grant was opposed to the use of galvanized Yankees uh, in the East, saying it is not right to expose them where to be taken prisoners, and they may surely suffer as deserters. 
And that's interesting. You know, we're talking about General Grant here. He had a compassion uh, for both sides. And, and you're talking about him saying, if they get caught <laughs> as deserters that were galvanized, that's not going to be any good treatment. I mean, for desertion, you could be killed. What are they going to do to you if you're deserted and join the Union Army? It's not going to be good. So he said, well, you know, for their own protection, um, you know, they need to be put in other places. And his idea was to put them in the West to handle frontier outposts. So the majority of those 5,600 uh, galvanized Yankees ended up in the West uh, at frontier outposts, dealing with areas that had trouble with Native American, um, you know, conflict. And so that's where they were put. Um, again, it gave them less of an opportunity to do what was the other problem, which was desertion, uh, just running away after they got out of the prison. Uh, and it also helped protect them from severe punishment afterwards. So they swallowed the dog. That's what they called uh, taking the oath. <laughs> Swallowing the dog. Um, Hugh Clemens, in September of 1863, he takes the oath of allegiance and joins the Company E of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry. The two, uh, they recruited him straight from the prison camp, two of the companies uh, of, of, um, of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry. And uh, the recruiting officer is an interesting man up here. I bet you nobody yet recognizes him. Uh, but that's a man named Captain, this is the Captain of Company E, Captain Andrew J. Pemberton. Pemberton, familiar? Pemberton, what? His older brother was John C. Pemberton. So he was the lieutenant general in the Confederate Army. So an interesting kind of, kind of coincidence there that uh, was actually the one who surrendered to General Grant at Vicksburg. So you had two brothers on either side of the war, and he's commanding former Confederate troops here. This is very interesting. So <clears throat> he signs off on the 21-year-old Five foot, five inch, brown haired, blue eyed Hugh Clements to, to join uh, the Union Army. I'm greatly indebted to a couple of folks, uh, R. Hugh Simmons uh, from the Fort Delaware Society and Dennis Brook, who have done a ton of research on galvanized Yankees and their relation to Fort Delaware. Um, just a wonderful amount of information they shared with me uh, and helped fill in a lot of the blanks of, of Hugh's service and his imprisonment. So you're looking at a picture, not of, of, of Fort Delaware, but of Confederates actually taking the oath of allegiance, swallowing the dog, as they would call it. Almost the same exact time that Hugh is taking his oath of allegiance, in September of um, 63, his brother Elijah, his brother-in-law Elijah, was picked up as a deserter in Raccoon Fort, Virginia. And he was held at Old Capitol Prison in, to, in Washington, D.C. until uh, finally in March of 1864, uh, he was allowed uh, to go home, to, but not go home to Georgia. There was no going home, going home to Georgia. Um, there was riots going on. There was riots, what they call bread riots in the South. And these were women that their children were starving, and they were stealing things and breaking windows and causing uh, all this, uh, you know, basically riots. Uh, stealing things just because they're desperate and want to feed their children. On top of that, you have the criminal deserters from the Confederate Army having to band together and hide from the authorities because they're desperate at this point to fill the ranks and so of uh, the Confederate Army. So there's a couple of reasons why um, he ended up going back north. It is a little bit interesting that they allowed him to go back up north. You know, Elijah must have given them uh, a compelling reason to let him out early and go back up north. And again, I don't know what that was. Um, but they did allow him, uh, and by the 1865 census, he's back uh, in uh, the Luzerne area again. What about his wife? Um, she shows up in the 1870 census. There's no, no real, uh, it, it, again, that's lost in the records. There's no telling if she came, was able to pass through the lines, uh, if she had come north before that, and maybe Elijah stayed at the early part of the war. Uh, for maybe maybe once uh, he entered the service, she went back up north. I don't know. It's a very interesting question. Uh, we'll go over what happened to him in the end, though, at, at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, again, so it is a, another one of those question marks. Uh, but uh, on top of all this, going on around the same time, you have 
Martin Clemens, this is Hugh's older brother, in August of 61, Hugh's older brother Martin Van Buren Clemens, um, he had stayed in Luzerne, he didn't go down to Georgia, he joined Company D of the 93rd New York Infantry, which was, you know, from this area up here, okay, the Southern Adirondacks. Uh, the lieutenant colonel of this unit was Benjamin Clapp but Butler, not to, be, not to be confused with Benjamin F. Butler, who was the, uh, uh, the beast of, of, of New Orleans. Um, but this guy actually would later uh, come back from the war and he would be instrumental in, in helping uh, uh, develop Lake Luzerne, the community 10 miles from here. Martin unfortunately died of disease in the fall of 1862. Um, it's, uh, it's likely that Hugh uh, did not receive word of this uh, until much later in the war. So, um, and there is no evidence that Hugh ever fought directly against his brother. Uh, but they, they may, uh, I don't know for sure, but they may have been on the same field of battle at Antietam um, at the same time. But it was shortly after that, that that Martin would die. So it's hard to say if he was in the hospital yet with his records. But he did lose a soldier, or he lost a brother. And this is the 93rd uh, New York Infantry, uh, just uh, before Antietam. So this is, this one unit, the 3rd Maryland Cavalry, has an interesting distinction. So we have the uniqueness of this man, Yankee galvanized Yankee. On top of that, we have the unique uniqueness of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry being the only unit that was sent south of the galvanized Yankees. Remember, I said they were all sent out west. This one was sent south to engage in the Red River campaign. So they actually actively campaigned against uh, other Confederates. The problem they had right off the bat, about 400 men, in these two companies, in the 3rd Maryland Cavalry, before they leave Baltimore for the South, for Louisiana, 40% desertion rate, right off the bat. Um, once they hit Louisiana, another 13%. Uh, so we're looking at 53% uh, des desertion uh, before they even get involved in the Red River campaign. So obviously, uh, this is why the U.S. government was very wary of um, the whole idea of, of galvanizing troops. Uh, it just wasn't worth their time and effort to re you know, recruit and to uh, you know, clothe these guys um, for the short period of time before they run off. So 200, about two, over 200 of the 400 um, deserted. The 3rd Maryland was also plagued with infighting in the officer corps at the top. Yeah, the officers were fighting with each other, so these men weren't even getting good uh, training, they weren't even getting good structure and discipline, so they were broken up during the Red River Campaign, and it shows because um, Hugh is uh, first, he's a regimental teamster, so that's why I have an image of, you know, kind of a teamster um, set up in the Civil War, and he's hauling supplies, and then he gets put on duty uh, in the um, in the ordnance department. So he's hauling heavy ordnance uh, for this campaign. It was an unsuccessful campaign uh, to, to open up the uh, Deep South, and uh, it was unsuccessful. Uh, so he was assigned a few duties there. He's doing odd jobs with the, you know, on detached duty. Damn the torpedoes. Probably one of the most famous lines of the Civil War. Who said it? Farragut. Admiral David Farragut. Uh, so he's trying to take uh, Mobile Bay in um, 1864, in the summer of 1864. And um, he wants to take control of, of the entire bay. And one of his obstacles was Fort Morgan. And you can see it, this is after it was besieged uh, in, in August of 1864. And one of the units that was part of this siege was the 3rd Maryland Cavalry. Uh, so they helped besiege this. Um, I don't think they took heavy casualties here. I think they were just more of an encircling force. Um, they took the forts in Mobile Bay, Mobile, Alabama, but they did not take Mobile. Mobile would not fall, the city itself, until April of 1865. But they still controlled the mouth of the bay. 
So you have the forts here, and this is uh, uh, where's Fort Morgan? Right here, Fort Morgan uh, and Fort Gaines. So Fort Fort Gaines is after this this fight. Uh, he's transferred over to this other island, Dauphin Island, and this is where Hugh gets put on as a hospital attendant. So he's a hospital attendant uh, at the Fort Gaines Hospital, um, and I can imagine it's a lot of tropical diseases. A lot of these northern men are not used to this climate, um, and so uh, he's got to deal with all this. This is probably where he gets his, essentially, his final assignment, which is he's actually an aide to the um, medical purveyor. Uh, for this area, for the Mobile Department, and so this is a you know this is a pretty important position. Obviously, he's he's got to help the purveyor uh, acquire and distribute all the medical supplies uh, for this area um, of action. So he's going to from from uh, August through November uh, he's going to be here, but then he's going to be um, he's going to be from November into uh, early 1865 he's going to be working at the purveyor's office and. <clears throat> He stays in the in the service. He, he returns to his unit and stays in the service until they're mustered out in Vicksburg in early September of 1865. So he actually serves right through to, to through through to the fall of 65, and then finally, after years of being away, he's finally able to re decides to return home north to Luzerne after the war. You, there was a lot of risk to going back down south. If he went back to, down to Georgia and they recognized him and knew his story, uh, he would be, um, you know, he would at the very least he'd be ostracized, if not punished, uh, by the community for what he had done. Uh, you know, so it, it obviously was a, a, a wise choice to go back to Luzerne. It, it, it must have been surreal to come back, though. I mean, he had been living in the South, a whole different culture, a whole different place, and, and he's been away for a few years. He's a young man. He's coming back after this ex horrible experience of war, fighting on both sides. It, it must have been amazing uh, to come back to this place where he had grown up as a child. Um, it does, however, seem like, as a veteran, he was able to settle in very well and very quickly. Um, you can see in this image, this is a map around the time, you can see Hugh Clemens, you know, and you can see his parents here. This is in 1876, so this is about uh, 12 years, or uh, I should say 11 years after the war. So he's, he's living only a mile or so away from his, you know, where he grew up, um, back home in, in, in Lake Luzerne. His, his brother, though, uh, brother-in-law and sister Martha and Elijah, they are back in southern Georgia in the census of 1870. So somewhere between 1865 and 70, they're back in Georgia again. And uh, picking up right where he left off, he's back to the confectioner's shop. Obviously, they allowed him back in. And uh, I, he didn't serve for the Union, but he did desert the Confederate Army. So maybe a couple of years that he was able to go back when it settled down, he was able to uh, recover his property. Uh, that's the only reason I could think for him going back down there is to recover property uh, and start his life up again. Hugh, however, was done with the South. <laughs> I can't blame him. Um, he could have, you know, faced criticism down there, especially after serving on the other side. Um, it, it does seem like his sincerity allowed him to be accepted by the community that he never lied about his Confederate service. He, he, he simply told everyone, you know, uh, I was pressed into the service. I didn't have a choice. And, you know, that seems to be true. Um, he settles in as a, a family man. Uh, he marries Martha Stewart. Uh, not that one. <laughs> uh, Martha Stewart um, in eight, about 1870, 71. And uh, they have children together. They have five children. One dies in infancy. But they have four surviving children. Uh, and uh, three daughters and a son. He becomes a businessman and a well, you know, well um, liked member of the community, and uh, very involved in, 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 in politics. We'll see a list in just a moment. Again, a family man, uh, a community man. He was very involved with his community. Uh, he had a business right on the. Um, if anybody's familiar with uh, the bridge that goes from Lake Luzerne to Hadley. Uh, it's, uh, there's Rockwell Falls, a beautiful waterfall under the bridge, and, and that's right just a block from that is where he had a hardware store right there. Um, 
in 1888. So he was a very active member of the community. Um, these are some of the things he did. It's quite amazing. He was a trustee. He was a fire warden. He was town supervisor three or four times. Um, he was a census numerator, postmaster, uh, board of education member, trustee of Union School District, and active very active in democratic politics. So he really was a, a very you know, upstanding uh, member of the community, very well respected. Um, but what's really interesting is uh, they didn't um, hold his Confederate service against him uh, because that was actually uh, disqualification if you served in the Confederate service to join in the Grand Army of the Republic Union Veterans, veterans uh, Organization. So he not only was allowed to join, he was became an officer. He was an officer, uh, different different posts uh, or he, in his post uh, Butler post of three sixteen uh, in Luzerne. He he held different offices while he was with them. Um, his wife Martha um, was in the uh, women's relief corps, so she was in the auxiliary. He also held offices in the Odd Fellows and the Ancient Order of United Workmen. That's the first I heard of that when I found that one out. Um, he was looking, interestingly enough, when you look up these newspapers and stuff, and it's great to research, I actually found that he was looking for fellow veterans in a national paper. Uh, he was looking for fellow veterans of the 3rd Maryland Cavalry. Maybe he was looking to put together a regimental history, maybe he was just looking to connect with them, but he had an advertisement out. So certainly he was definitely interested in reconnecting. Um, he didn't take an advertisement out for the 26th Georgia. But, uh, so these pictures may or may not look familiar to you. Um, in Hugh and, uh, and some of his comrades of the GR Post 316, and there was many GR Posts that were involved at, at different times and different uh, parts of Grant's funeral procession from Mount McGregor here to New York City. Uh, on August 4th, they had a memorial service here at Grant Cottage on the porch, and then they placed his body on a funeral train. And one of the details inside the open funeral train, the open car that had his co uh, coffin, was some GAR members, some guards. And in those guards was Hugh Clemens. Uh, he guarded Grant's body as it left the mountain and in Saratoga as well before it was taken to Albany in New York City. So interesting that a man who had donned the gray at one time uh, for a substantial amount of time now stood next to the casket uh, of the greatest hero of the Union. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, Grant didn't make that distinction after the war. He saw everyone, North and South, as Americans. Uh, he supported veterans groups on both sides. So this is the train arriving in Saratoga Springs, the funeral train coming down off Mount McGregor down to the station. And these are most of these are Civil War veterans. Uh, and some of them are getting off the train. So, you know, Clemens, he could be in here somewhere. Um, you know, one of the GAR veterans um, at Saratoga in August of 1884. Hugh died uh, at 67 years old in, in Luzerne. Uh, he died in Albany, I should say, at a hospital, but he, he lived the rest of his life in Lake Luzerne. And on May 28th, 1910, at 67 years old, he passed away. And uh, his final bivouac, uh, in this gravestone, is in Luzerne Cemetery, the main cemetery of the town, uh, along with his, the rest of his family. Um, his sister and brother-in-law passed away, they had moved to Orlando area, Florida, and they passed away in 1891-92. Um, and they're both in Florida. You see a, a Union marker here, or a, a, at least a military marker from the U.S. here next to his gravestone. Interesting enough, when you look at his brother-in-law, uh, somebody has, has placed a Confederate marker next to his in Orlando, Florida, where he's buried next to his wife. Martha, his wife, uh, passed away in 1922. You know, of course, Hugh was given full military honors. He had, obviously, by 1910, he had sent a lot of his own uh, friends away, you know, his comrades in arms uh, to, to their final resting place. Uh, but the, it was his turn to receive full military honors uh, by the GAR when he was laid to rest. Um, 
I'll read just a quick part of his um, obituary, and it really gives you an idea of the what, how he was regarded by his community. He said, Hugh Clemens has gone, but the influence of, of his upright life, his sterling character, and public spirit will live after him. His high and unyielding sense of honor, integrity, and righteousness, his quick perception, sound judgment, and splendid foresight always gave value to his counsel for the present and future good of the community. Without deliberately looking backward through the years of his active, vigilant, and influential connection with the affairs of this village of ours, can we fully comprehend and appreciate his distinguished service to his fellow men. Shirley Luzerne has lost one of her most manly men. Um, so I'll open it up to uh, questions if anybody has any. Sure. Is, is galvanized Jackie, is that considered a negative term? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it, it has to do with the idea that you've got a thin layer of metal going over the true metal. And that's the same thing. You've got the, somebody who at their heart, at their core, has no interest in being a Union soldier if they were Confederate. But they put on the galvanized outfit of a Union, but their true heart, their true, you know, true heart is, is for the, for the So he, he, so. he was understood to be a, a galvanized Yankee, but he's, he's still got this uh, credit from the folks in Luzerne to, uh, well, I think they, he, he was able, that's again the thing that I have to take on, on uh, faith is that he definitely had a way of, con he convinced everyone that he was fully, uh, his service in the Confederacy was fully involuntary. Um, so he, uh, when he, he became a, a, a galvanized Yankee, but he really wasn't. You know, that's the interesting thing about it. Most galvanized Yankees were galvanized. He was actually not really galvanized because he did want to fight for the Union, <laughs> you know, according to his, his admissions later on. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what he told his captors at the uh, forts, and this is what he also told people later on in his life and what ended up in his obituary, even, that he was pressed into the service. This was his story, and, uh, you know, I think it's fairly believable. Um, things like that did happen um, on occasion when people were stuck in the South and didn't feel at liberty to leave. Uh, again, a lot of unanswered questions, but he certainly was, this, this, uh, story he gave them was fully accepted by everyone, by, you know, the pension department, by the GAR, by the, you know, community. I would imagine his credentials by the time he, he put in for his pension were enough. You know, the fact that he had been a supervisor of a town in the north, the fact that he had been, you know, fully committed to his community, um, that he was an active member of the GAR, I think all these played in his favor when he went for his pension. But it's, it's a fascinating story, and again, all the, we don't have all the, all the pieces, but it really, uh, I, I'm going to continue to research it. Somewhere something will come up where maybe I'll finally figure out what brought him to southern Georgia. What, what in the world? I mean, you can bake, you can make candy anywhere. What are you, what are you going down there? But uh, that would be fascinating. I looked everywhere in, in uh, his brother-in-law's family to look for a Georgia connection, nothing. Uh, nothing in the Clemens family with a Georgia connection. So that's what I looked at first, but uh, again, I couldn't find anything. So. Uh, again, a little strange that they stayed after the uh, secession, but maybe they didn't feel at liberty to travel at that time. Where did you do your research? Was it with the Library of Congress? Or? Yeah, so I was, uh, those two gentlemen I mentioned uh, from the Fort Delaware Society and some other places, um, they were kind enough to uh, send me a lot of the uh, records that they had, because they've already compiled records on all these galvanized Yankees. And, um, they've already gotten the records from the Confederate service records, and they already got the service records. So I landed on somebody they already had in their, in their, in their research, um, but I don't even think they knew how unique his situation was, because they had his records, but they didn't, you know, really, uh, didn't send up a red flag to them um, until I contacted them and asked for more information. So they provided me with all that. Otherwise, I would have had to go and, you know, uh, you know pay for it and get the, you know, so it was really great to have them. You can, you can access his records. Um, but as I mentioned, Confederate records are a lot harder to come by. Uh, a lot of them were lost or destroyed um, during the war. It's interesting to know the true term of galvanizing, because I've been being active for 12 years. When we see galvanizing, sometimes we portray Confederate, yeah. other times we portray Union. Yeah, and 5,600 is a low number. I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of million people in, the, in the, both armies, you know, the huge armies. And so 5,600 is not a lot. Of, this is not something they did a lot of. Uh, this was only at, in the later part of the war after they ended the, the cartel. But as you mentioned, 
uh, reenactors do here, the Civil War reenactors hear this term because we use it as a lighter term for portraying the other side in a battle. We have both outfits and we'll portray, because uh, I'm a Civil War reenactor too, we'll portray a Confederate at one event when they need more Confederates uh, for the, uh, for the uh, event and then Union on an, at another time. So that's fairly common for, for uh, reenacting units to galvanize. But as you mentioned, I didn't fully understand what, what it really meant in the war and the history of galvanizing until, until I started researching uh, you over here. How long did it take you to gather all this? I've been at it, picking away at it a couple of years. It hasn't been, you know, I've, you know, on and off, you know, but uh, yeah, it did, I, I reached out to the right people and they really helped me out. Like I said, they did a lot of research on those galvanized Yankees and there's studies on it. You can look it up. Uh, Fort Delaware Society is a great one. If you look up their website, there'll be some, um, you know, probably PDFs and things and newsletters that they, you know, they do a lot on that. Um, you can look up Galvanized Yankees. There is a Wikipedia page, but um, you know, there, there, you really have to dig in to really get the true flavor of, of the uh, experience as well. Any other questions? Wonderful. Well, thanks so much. Feel free. If you got any more questions, you can come up. Thanks for, thanks for